Well, today we have a very special guest. Not only is he the first person that we're actually doing a live podcast with, he is an Olympic athlete. Today we have an amazing guest. Not only is he our first in-person recording, but he's also an Olympic athlete and 27-time U.S. record holder for weightlifting, correct? That's right. It was 27 times. Shane Hammond. Shane, welcome to our show, The Thank Whole Person you. Podcast. Thank you for being here, man. Glad to be here, man. Love to be on this first live show. I, dude, well, you're going to be a great guest to have and really, really excited about it. So I met you a week ago. Was it a week it ago? It was about a week. I think it was about a week ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. About a week ago at Young Businessmen of Tulsa. And you gave a little bit of your story and I have a lot of questions for you, but for the people that haven't heard you speak before, go ahead and tell us just your journey and your story. Well, for me, you know, it started, it started, well, I'm from, from uh, Mustang, Oklahoma, just outside of Oklahoma city, grew up on a farm when I was six years old. My, my family moved us out there. My dad and mom moved me and my two older brothers out there to, the, to a little farm. And we opened a fruit stand at the Oklahoma City Farmer's Market. And that's where it all kind of started, man. Just learning the hard work and all that. And uh, just started in sports, started started soccer and loved soccer and played it until I was 13. And then when I got into high school, I decided to play football. And I was pretty good at football, pretty good at wrestling. But I just fell in love with lifting weights because the first time I ever lifted my freshman year, I broke all the school records. Hmm. And so – that got me all excited about, you know, of course, uh, wanting to lift more when everyone's like, Oh man, you're so good at this. You're doing good. You know, cause I didn't even know what I was doing. Right. In but football, in football or, or, or lifting. Oh gosh. Yeah. And so I had just been lifting, you know, big pumpkins and watermelons on the farm and all that. <laughs> and then I guess it, you know, kind of helped my strength, but I knew that for sure it was a God given gift because it came so natural to me. Right. And so that's where it all started. And I just started to train after school and lift and kind of write my own programs and I started competing right when I graduated high school when I was 19 years old I did my first powerlifting competition which is the squat the bench press and the deadlift mm -hmm. so I did those first competition and at the first competition I broke all the teenage world records oh wow and so that of course got me way more excited about it at that point right and so I went on to compete until I was 23 years old so like four more years of competition and I won gold medals at two world championships and won three national championships and broke 14 world records during that time. 14 world records? 14 world records. So oh, I had, wow. a, had a pretty amazing career in powerlifting, but I saw the Olympics on TV in 1996. And you're like, I think I want to go to that. Yeah. I was like, man, how do I do this? And so um, you had, I had to switch sports from powerlifting which was really about how strong you are mm -hmm. to go into the Olympic lifts, which is, has a lot of technique involved. And I had asked around a lot of people and everybody told me no one's been able to successfully switch from powerlifting to weightlifting. Don't do it. Don't waste your time. You're already one of the top guys in the world here in, in the sport of powerlifting. Why would you waste your time? And so um, I did anyway. I decided to try it because I just wanted to be an Olympian. Right. You know, and I, I just had to, I remembered back when I was seven years old, it's something I remembered back and it came back to me at that time. I remember someone came to our class at seven years old and they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want you to write it down. And I remember writing down, I wanted to be an Olympian. Hmm. And I didn't know what for, you know, I didn't know at the time I was just starting to play soccer at the time. Didn't really know, but, but I remembered that I went back and remembered that, that I wanted to be an Olympian and that came to my mind because I wrote it down. I remember writing it down and so I was like yeah, man I want to be an Olympian again and so it kind of came back to me and sure enough I I, uh, I started training I switched sports and four years later I made my first Olympic team and got to compete in Sydney Australia in 2000 and at that competition I broke three American records and finished 10th place okay and then I made my second Olympic team in 2004 got to compete in Athens Greece that year and got the place seventh place and broke two American records at that competition. Okay. So then I decided I was going to see, I was 32 years old at the 2004 games. So I was like, can I go till I'm 36 or not? 
you know, I was kind of getting up there in age for the sport. And so I decided to go one more year. And during that, that year, I started feeling my back kind of go out and, you know, mm-hmm. things were kind of hurting. So I won the national championships in the Pan Am games and I quit. Gotcha. And I was like, I'm going to quit while I'm on top. Right. And never hit the platform again. <laughs> so that was my career in a nutshell. So in, in the conversation or the speech that you gave, you're talking about some of the injuries and some of the personal struggles that, that you faced and not only that, but how your faith was such a huge part of not only just your training, but your outlook through the entire process. What was, what was that like maintaining your, your faith and then even being vocal about it? Cause so many times, sorry, I'm, I'm asking multiple questions here. It's hard for Christians to live their faith publicly in this day and age without fearing that they're going to offend someone or getting ridiculed or written up. But if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, what does it look like to live your faith publicly in what you do? I mean, for me, you know, I was lucky enough to be raised in a Christian home. You know, my, my parents raised me and my brothers to be, to put God first in whatever we did. And, and it, it stuck with me, man. I mean, you know, a lot of people have testimonies of going away from God and doing this and that, but you know, I felt so strongly about it and I saw God do so many things in our lives. And then, you know, when we were struggling, God would create a miracle for us financially to, to be able to do this. Or, you know, I saw him heal people physically growing up, you know, whenever we would have injuries, when we wouldn't have money to go to the doctor, things like that. So really, I think just in my life, I just built up so much faith that I knew God was real and I know God is real. And to me, what he gave me to be able to be the top guy in the world at a sport, he gave it to me. Right. Now I'm just saying the whole time I'm like, dude, he could take it away from me just as quick as he gave it to me. Yeah. So if I try to go sit, do say I did this on my own, I'm being a total crazy nut because this was all a God thing. And just all along the way, he just led me and just did, did things for me and was there for me during all the hard times during the injuries, you know, he healed me during injuries. He got me through this stuff. And so, yeah, I was ridiculed a few times. Tell, tell our audience, some of the the healing stories that actually happened, you had two of them and both of them were really, really interesting. And you really put God on a spot both times publicly And essentially, I'm not going to say forced God's hand to show up, but you're like, hey, I'm publicly declaring this. And if you don't show up, you and I are both going to look like chumps. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, the first one, and it's the one that was the kind of the craziest miracle that that God did for me. And it was getting ready for the 1999 National Championships. I was three weeks out. I was doing some clean and jerks. Uh, It was 462 pounds I was supposed to do for for four or five singles that day. And it was, I think it was on the second or third one. I was cleaning it and my elbows didn't get up like they should have. And my elbows hit my knees and it dislocated both of my wrists. So they just went out of socket. So I ran in the back, my wrist popped back in, but after going to sports medicine and all that, after that, they said it was going to be six months until I could lift again. Cause my wrists, I mean, my, you know, my tendons were just messed up. And my wrists were giant and swollen and I couldn't do anything. So anyway, it was three weeks out from nationals. And I started telling people that I was going to lift at nationals anyway, that God was going to heal me. And I just felt really confident about it. And I knew that God was going to heal me. And so I went, I prayed every day. I mean, I couldn't do a lot of training. So I would pray every day, God, heal my wrists, heal my wrists. And he didn't heal my wrists. And so I didn't get to train for the whole three weeks, but I went to nationals anyway, and I showed up. Then my family all came because they knew that God was going to heal me too. Cause I told them, I told them God's going to heal me. And they said, okay, we're going to come and watch. So everybody that was there at the training center was sitting there thinking I was nuts. Coaches thought I was nuts. Now was, was this the one where you had to cling a specific amount to, to move forward in a competition? No, that was at the Olympic trials. Okay. We'll get to that one. We'll get to that. Okay. But this one was basically, I mean, it was a national championships before the Olympics. It was kind of, it was an important meet. 
that I needed to right. compete at. And so the day before the competition, I went in the warm up room and I couldn't even hold a broomstick over my head. My wrists were still hurting that much. I mean, it was just like hardly any weight at all. So the day of the competition came and I went in the back warm up room and I put a hundred, I put 70 or 50 kilos on the bar, which is a hundred and whatever it is. 115 pounds. Don't ask me. I don't, I don't, I don't know those measurements. <laughs> so anyway, I put 50 kilos on the bar and I got set up to lift it. And I knew that it was going to kill my wrist. You know, it was going to blow, you know, just kill it. If, it, if I lifted this or God was going to heal me. And so everybody's watching me. My coach is there. Everybody's sitting there. And so I grabbed the bar and I said, God, I'm going to lift this and you have to heal me. I've been telling everybody that you're going to heal me. And, so you have to right now because I'm going to do this whether you heal me or not <laughs> so I just grabbed it and I just and as soon as I started pulling the weight the pain went away wow. and I and the pain went away and I lifted that day and won nationals and broke three American records at that competition wow and no pain no pain and so it was a it was a time where it was scary but I I, I was, I was like, God, you've done so many other things in my life. And I, I know that you're real and I know that you've healed people before. And I know that you've healed me before. And so I'm putting you on the spot here. And when, like I said, we're both going to look bad if this doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> I'm going to look really bad because it's going to hurt, <laughs> but it's going to, you know, and I said, I just, I just want to do this. And I wanted to do it because my whole goal in my whole lifting career was to show, to try to lead people to God and show him, show people God through what I was doing. That was my whole goal anyway. The whole reason I was doing what I was doing. And so from that point forward, living at the Olympic Training Center with all the other athletes there, they all saw it happen. And um, it started giving me lots and lots of opportunities to lead people to Jesus after that. So I went through a hard time myself, put God on the spot. He came through and through that, a lot of people met Jesus. And then you had another injury that you were talking about while you were going to qualify for the Olympics. Tell us about that story. Yeah, so it was at the it was actually the Pan Am Games that same year, getting ready to, you know, as a qualifier for the Olympics. And I uh, three weeks out again, I tore my quad. I tore in my leg. I tore a muscle, and wasn't able to lift. Um, wasn't able to squat up and down with it because it was just you know it was ripped. And so right. I couldn't, I couldn't train for that competition either. And so I went to Pan Am's anyway. I said, I'm going here and God's going to heal me just like he did at nationals. Cause this was after that. And everybody saw what, what happened at nationals. So they said, okay, we'll go ahead and fly up there anyway. Right. See what happens. And so this time it was different because God didn't heal my leg. It did, the pain didn't go away this time. But what I did was I lifted, I put all the pressure on one leg and lifted and the pain didn't go away but i was able to lift as much weight lean into one side and won the pan am games on one leg on one leg basically <laughs> so it was a whole different kind of miracle that god did for me <laughs> and so you know oh, it was just funny. it was a weird deal but but it was god and, and he did it and everybody saw that too that that's funny so you've had this kind of almost this reckless faith so to say, not reckless where it's, you know, it, it's terrible, you know, it's not worthy, but you've really put God in a position or this is not going to turn out well. There's a lot of people, including myself, that would have a hard time doing that. And I think that speaks deeper to just a cool story. So for people that struggle with trusting God or putting faith in God, what message of hope would you have to bring them based off of your experience? I just have to say that God wants us to be healed. He wants us to get through the struggles we're going through and he wants us to have the things that we need. And so there's no reason not to go for it. I mean, I knew in my heart that God was going to take care of me in my time of need when I needed it. And he'll do the same for each and every one of you. You know, he said, we just need the faith of a mustard seed, right? For it to, to move a mountain. 
I mean, all we got to do is believe and you got to really believe that right. he's going to do it for him to do it. Right. You know, your story reminds me of something that, that I was studying about uh, last, last week, actually. It was about hope and faith because in my own life, I've been having difficulties lately, just trusting God. I've had a lot of bad stuff happen and my, my hope and my faith in God has been very diminished to, to just be honest. And for whatever reason, I just, I decided that to pull out my Bible and read it, which I haven't done in a very long time. I normally would just read audio Bible and listen to it. But that day I decided to, to pull out the Bible. And while I was reading it, uh, there's a scripture in Romans 8. It talked about um, how faith kind of leads to hope, essentially. And so I started thinking about the moment where the disciples were in the boat with Jesus and how the storm came and Jesus was asleep. And then the disciples got scared and went to Jesus and said, don't you care that we're going to die? And he gets up, rebukes the storm, and then rebukes the disciples and says, oh, ye of little faith. And the, the disciples were like, okay, great. Thank you. You know, <laughs> but they had the physical presence of Jesus with them from the beginning and they didn't have faith or hope. Their circumstance, their situations determined the way that they perceived or the way they would feel about their situation, which made me also think of the exact opposite of their situation, which was Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, where they got thrown into the furnace and then Jesus appeared and the king essentially is like, hey, didn't we only throw three guys in there? And there's a fourth guy and he looks like a son of God. Bring them out. So they come out and basically after defying the king's orders not to bow down and basically said, even if we do die, we're still not going to serve your gods. We believe our God will deliver us. But even if not, oh well. And so the king pulls them out. And here's what happens. The king says, no other God can save like this God. So he issues a decree. If anyone talks negative about their God, I mean, right. Shadrach and Abednego, you're going to get chopped up into little pieces. Yeah. But here's, here's where your story is very similar to those two stories that I realized. One, God delivered you from with, with the hands. Like you, you struggled with it, but at the moment, God delivered you from it. Kind of like he did with the disciples in the boat. God delivered them from it. And then with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, there wasn't deliverance. They got thrown into the furnace. But Jesus was with them in the furnace too. After the fact. He didn't show up beforehand. He showed up after the fact. And your story reminds me of both of those because both times Jesus showed up, but he showed up differently in both scenarios. And I think sometimes as Christians, we expect Jesus to show up in a particular way or a way that we want him to show up, which then when he does it, it becomes disappointing to us. So that was just a tangent I went on. Yeah. But I mean, like you said, it's sometimes we want it in our timing, not God's timing right? or our way, not God's way. I mean, but you know, every, and, and see, I have more stories of injuries that God healed me too. I mean, it happened four or five times, really different things, but, you know, every time I, I sure wish God would have healed me instantly, uh, you know, a couple of days after the injury and then I could have trained and then went and, you know, had the competition, but it was just different. It was, he made it more dramatic, right? But it kind of came down to the moment and, and like, especially the one with the wrists, it came down to the moment of me having to trust him for one thing, but everybody was there watching, right? You know, it kind of built this thing up, it kind of built up and they're like, what's going to happen. And then it happened. And so everybody saw it and it really, you know, so, I mean, sometimes he just does, has to do his timing for the most people to be touched. Possibly. Absolutely. I don't know. So you, you broke 27 U S records, correct? Correct. How many world records did you break? I broke 14 world records in powerlifting in powerlifting. Okay. And then in Olympic lifting, I broke uh, 27 American 20, records. Okay. Perfect. So here's my question, because so many times when I hear people speak like, oh, wow, that person is such a phenomenal, incredible, gifted human being. There's this disconnect between how awesome and great they are 
and where I'm currently at in my life. And this is our second time getting to meet each other, but we got to talk last time and you know, you're an average guy. Um, sorry to say that, but you're an yeah. average dude. <laughs> like, yeah. hey, I'll no, take it. You've done some amazing things in your life. And, but those don't define you. Those aren't your identity or you came to my house. Like, you know, so what I'm saying is for people that when they look at people who have amazing accomplishments, it's like, oh man, that person's kind of put on a pedestal in our own mind. <laughs> How do we break down those own barriers within ourselves? Because it's like, I can't ever be like Sean or sorry, Shane. And how do people o- overcome those limiting beliefs about themselves? I mean, see, that's a good question. Um, I don't even know. I don't even know. I mean, that was deep. I'm just, all I know is, all I know is just me. And I, like you said, I am just a regular dude that God did. Pumpkin, a, pumpkins up from the farm. Yeah. That God did a few things through. And I really don't think I did anything that special, but I, I did what I was supposed to be doing. I know everybody, every single person has something that God gave them to do. So how, how can those people discover what that is if they don't know what it is? Whatever you're good at, try it. And if something else comes along that's better and that you're better at, change. So I had to change in my career. I had to change, change a few times to different things mm-hmm. to find what ultimately what I was supposed to be doing. And now I'm doing something different. You know, I'm raising a family. I'm, you know, at my job, I do something different. So it's just, you know, my life is different now, but I still use what I have to reach people for Jesus. Right. And it's just where, wherever you are in life, find what you're, what you're best at at the time and go for it. So our podcast, it's, it's the whole person podcast. And you now we have this wheel of wisdom, faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, and fun. And, you know, while, while I'd love to be so great at every single one of those things, you know, I'm, I'm a growing, working individual learning to get better at those areas of life. And so are many of our listeners. What encouragement that you feel most applicable to share based off of that, that wheel, what would be some advice that you'd want to give someone in? It could be faith, family, finances, friendship, fitness, or fun. I mean, for me, for me right now, I mean, I think the most important thing for me is, I mean, the most important things are family and faith, you know, but you got to have everything that's in the wheel right. though. Really? You need it. But, so you got a flat tire. <laughs> yeah. So you got your, you know, the, the faith is so important though. As long as you keep God first and all that you do, things are going to be all right with you. Yeah. It's not always going to be perfect, but he's going to get you. And then I'll give you an example. You know, I spoke, I spoke a week ago. And I was raving about how I just landed a new thing at work. And then come Friday, this last week, Friday, which is like four days ago, I got laid off of my job. Right. And it was just a crazy thing. But I had three, had three offers on the table three days later in, in a really crazy, you know, time in the oil and gas industry. And so, but it was, it was really weird. Was when I got laid off, you know, I'm like, oh, finances. That's what right. came in my head. But I was like, I'm not even worried. Mm. I was like, God's got this because I have faith in him and I trust him and I love him. And I've always kept him first. So I don't have anything to worry about. And as soon as I left, I started making calls and people started calling me back. And I, I had like eight opportunities within five hours of getting laid off, which is crazy. But right. it's just a God thing. And it's just, I think, because I keep my faith in God that he did that. And so that was faith and finances together Mm -hmm. and family. Of course, the reason I'm trying to, you know, keep my finances up is for my family. So I can have, you know, support my family, have a house, that kind of stuff. So it all kind of works together. But I think the base of it has, that has to be faith, right? Having faith in God, he's going to take care of you. So that reminds me, I hopefully I don't butcher this, but I think it's Matthew 6 33 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you is what the scripture says. And I, from what I hear from your story, what I'm picking up on is you, what you focus on expands. And so regardless of your circumstances or your situations or the layoff or the injuries, your main focus has just been your trust in God. And then by putting 
that one thing first, everything else will start aligning up. Might not be in the time or the way that you want, but God turns it all out for his good. That's exactly. what I'm hearing you say. That's exactly what I said. Okay. Yeah. You just put it in different words. So. Yep. Yep. That's awesome, man. So you're, you're getting this new job. You're, you've lifted for years. What, what's future goals, future plans for you? <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> To, to be disclosed right now. And okay, so be ready in 2021. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <Right. Not really. laughs> what well, is it? I mean, really, for me, I mean, this point in my life, just, you know, I have a, I have a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old. Yeah. And, you know, for, for me, I want my kids to have opportunities, you know, all the opportunities in the world to be able to tell people about Jesus too, just like I did. And so... And it's been really cool to see, like I have a nine-year-old daughter, she's my oldest one, and she's already a very high-level gymnast. And every day, whenever we're taking her to practice, she practices 12 hours a week already. Wow. And every day on the way to practice, she turns the radio down from the back seat. She turns it down and she says, God, I asked you to be with me today. I want people to see you through me and I want to give everything I do to you. And you know, as a dad, to see that, and just to hear my daughter say that, man, I mean, I'm like, dude, I'm kind of doing something right here, right. you know, trying to raise my kids right to, to trust in Jesus too. And so, and then my other, you know, my seven year old kid, he's, he, he, we they go to public school and he is trying to get people saved every day. And it's just, it's just awesome to see my kids starting this legacy of their own, um, telling people about Jesus and believing in God, believing in him and just knowing that he's real and uh going out and doing their part so would you say despite all the world records that you've broken the legacy that you're wanting to leave is exactly what you just said which is your children living a life of faith to influence others absolutely and you know my kids sometimes it you know my my past does get the kids to listen other kids to listen to my kids because they know me you know right. I, I speak at the school and give motivational speeches sometimes and so all the kids know me and so it does give my kids you know a little bit of opportunity to be able to do that have you thought about writing a book i have i do i do i do have a book it's called from melons to metals from melons to metals that's cool well, i didn't even know that so tell us about it yeah it's just i mean it's it's a, basically tells the story i told from growing up in Mustang and just kind of tells my whole story all the way through the Olympics. And then a little bit after the Olympics right, and ends right before I um, had my daughter nine okay. years ago. And uh, so it's just, and I have all, all the stories in there. I have all the stories about my miracles and, and behind the scenes of the Olympics and what it's like, but it is out of print right now. It's hard to get because the gotcha. publisher went out, but I'm working on republishing it and I'm actually going to add another chapter Okay. Because I'm actually going to add a whole new section, probably five chapters and changing the title because really? nine years ago I got into the oil industry as a mud engineer. And so I have three and a half years that I was on a oil rigs okay. working as a mud engineer. And then I, that's what I sell now. And so I'm, and I have a lot of stories of things that God did out there on the, in the, on the oil rig. So from melons to, to metals, metals to, to mud. mud. Exactly. That's awesome. That's going to be the new title. And it's going to have a lot of chapters in there from, of crazy stories from oil rigs. Okay. I think it'll be interesting. So I, I was just told by someone yesterday that one of the best ways to publish right now, you could do self-publishing through Amazon and you can upload your book to Amazon and then they will print and make the book on order. So oh, if someone wow. went to order it, so instead of having to pre-create all these books and then have so much money tied up in existing inventory, you can print one book at a time based off of the sale. Wow, interesting. So check that I'll out. I have to check that out. Yeah. yeah, that's different. Yeah, Jim Stovall told me that. So, okay, okay. So he might be a great resource. I, yeah, I'm no kidding. He probably would. So, I mean, he's written over like 30 books. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. when do you think that book will be coming out? I mean, it's probably going to be six months or six so months. from now. Yeah. Okay. I'm working on it slowly. Well, we'll, we'll keep tuned. 
Well, man, I just thank you so much today for taking the time to hop to my house to be our first guest on the video. If you're not watching the video, but he's here at my house. We have this cool little setup that I, I created. Yep. Tell them how cool the setup is. Come on, it I'm proud cool. of it. I mean, how can you be, there's a, there's a guitar up here. There's an American flag and it's an old American flag, yeah. which is sweet. And then you got the screen back here. Yeah. And the nice wood wall. I know. So, I mean, you cannot beat the setup. You can't. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you again so much for your time and uh, just your story, your experience. Is there anything that we can do to, to add value to you? Man, just live your life for Jesus, man. That's all. I mean, there's really nothing that I need. God's got me covered, but I don't know. I just, I just hope that some, you know, through, through my story, all I, all I want to do is I want someone to maybe be encouraged to have more faith mm -hmm. and to be able to step out there, whatever the situation is that, that you're in. Cause everyone's in a situation. Everyone's in some kind of situation where they're having a tough time at times. Yeah. And just, I just want to encourage you you know, through some of my stories to just trust in God and he will take care of you and he'll be there. And, and even if it takes some time, you're going to recover, you're going to get taken care of. So awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so we'll much. We'll talk to you soon. All right.